Amen. We're going to continue this morning in our study in the book of Peter. And I want you to open up again in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, brother Peter and Gwen, sister Gwen would have heard this message last week uh, because I preached this there as well. Uh, so this is a repeat of a message I preached last week, but it will be fresh to you. You say, but you're repeating, it's old bread. God's word is no, never old bread. Isn't that right, Glenn? It's always fresh. Uh, like on the table this morning, we had fresh bread. When you open up God's word, it's fresh bread. And I love fresh bread. Once it comes out of the oven, isn't it, Will? It smells beautiful. And you, you, can, you can envision yourself, you take butter, and you put it on that warm bread, and it melts into it. Who loves that? Oh, man, that's beautiful. So this is what the Word of God is. It's fresh, right out of the oven of God, and it smells good. And we just want to get into the Word of God. So without any further ado, let's read the Word of God this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1, he says, Therefore, we all know that that's an application word. You need to ask the question, what is therefore, therefore? And you need to read before the therefore, why therefore is therefore? And what for is therefore, therefore? How many therefores can you put into one sentence? So here we find, therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Who have tasted that? Who knows that God is gracious? We are serving a gracious God, amazing grace. And, and let me just say, brother and sister, we, we stand on God's graciousness, not on man's graciousness. Man is not as gracious as God. If indeed you have tasted, you see that? You have tasted it, that the Lord is good. He says now in verse 4, coming to Him as to a living stone. Everybody say living stone. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. How precious is he? You also, talking to us now as living stones, plural. You see the plural there? Living stones. We also come to him, are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Now what do we do to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ? How wonderful is God's word? Living stones. In verse 6 he says, therefore, again there is that word therefore. It is also contained in the scripture, behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe. Do you believe this morning? Who believes? Put up your hand. He's talking to us. He says, to you who believe. To you, he is precious. Is he precious to you? He's everything for me. He's so precious, He's everything for me. You say, but wait a minute, you are married, you've got a family and everything. Yes, I know, they are also precious, but He is more precious than everything you have. You see, even in in front of your family, yes, because without Him you will not have a family. You lose everything, everything you will lose without Him. To you who believe, He is precious, but, what does that mean? Sharp contrast. But to those who are disobedient, to those, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That is a tragic story. That is the story of our world today. People are rejecting him. He is to the world a stone of stumbling. He is to the world a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word. To what? They are disobedient to what? To the word. 
That's why they stumble. They are throwing the word away. I can tell you now, in some houses you're going, you won't even find a Bible anymore. Oh, how it's changed over the last 30 years. Oh, how it's changed. 30 years ago, at least, at least, you will find a Bible in a house somewhere. In a cupboard, in a closet, locked away some, at least you will find one. You would go to the hotels all over the world, you will pull up the drawer and what will be in there? A Bible. I travel to, to hotels. I tell you now, there's no Bibles in hotel rooms anymore. There's no Bibles. It's, it's a spirit of disobedience. Because, because of this fact that he's becoming a stone. No, 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 let me correct myself. He is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to this world. What was that? They stop getting Bibles into the hotels. You don't get them. He says, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Now look at verse 9. He says, but, what does but mean? Come on. Sharp contrast. There's that big theological word again. But, praise the Lord, you are a chosen generation. Who is he talking to? He's talking to us, the children of God, the select, the persecuted ones, the, the scattered ones. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A royal, not only a priesthood, a royal priesthood. Donald Trump is over there in London now and he visited the Queen. And what happens? Everybody, when this lady walks past, they curtsy. They curtsy to this lady, to a person. Let me tell you, that royalty means nothing. Absolutely nothing in heaven. You are, you're going up against the Queen now. Oh, oh, oh. I'm telling you what the Bible says. He says, you are a royal priesthood. They won't be bowing in heaven to when you walk around. They'll be bowing to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. I read in the book of Revelation that when we receive the crowns, what are we going to do with the crowns? Walk around and go, oh, look at my crown, man. Woohoo! Look at this thing on my head. Is that what we're going to do? No, 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 we're going to take our crowns and we're going to put it before the throne of God. Praise the Lord! A royal priesthood, a holy nation. Is the nation holy? If you look around you, are we living in a holy world? No, we're not. But he says, you are chosen. You are chosen to be a holy nation. His own special people. How privileged. Do you feel love this morning? Special people. Whenever you walk into this world, you are special people. He says, special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Whenever I preach that word marvelous, I like to pull it out like that. It's not just marvelous. It is marvelous light. Amen? Do you feel the power in that? It's not only my voice. Come on. It is marvelous light. Oh man, we're going to preach the word this morning. You better hang on. How wonderful is it? Once, who were once not people, but now the people of God. I am proud to be the people of God this morning. Are you? Are you? In a world which rejects Him, in a world that is a stumbling block, a rock of offense, we are the people of God. Then we better behave like the people of God, yes? Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And we say thank you to God for His mercy. Because without mercy, you wouldn't have been here. I wouldn't have been here. It's His mercy. It's His grace. For you were saved by faith through grace. Uh, by, by grace through faith, beg your pardon. That not of yourself, but that of Him. Yes. Let's thank the Lord for His word. Heavenly Father. I thank you so much for the word this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that your word has been read out in public, although we'd be in this confined room. But these people have heard your word this morning. And I'm so grateful for that. Father, your word is anointed. It is living. These people have experienced the living word this morning. Your living word. 
And now the word says in Isaiah, it will not go out and come back void, but it will accomplish everything that it's been purposed for. And I pray, Lord, speak to us this morning. Purpose in your lives. Your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about living stones. 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 4 to 5. Living stones. And if you think about stones, there's a lot of things you can do with stones. Who remembers this? Yeah? <laughs> I, uh, I grew up next to the Vaal River in South Africa. And man, endless times, me and my nephews, we would get the pebbles, the one, the flat ones goes the furthest. And we would search all over the banks and we would find these flat ones and we would have a competition there. And we would stand there and it's just, you know, it's just not throwing it. It goes, whoop, dump. No, no, it, you've got to get it right. You've got to, you know, you've got to really slingshot it. Once you slingshot it, it just goes on the water and it slips on the water. We had a competition, you know, who can go the more? How many times can you get it going? Have you guys done it as well or was it only me? lot of fun we spent hours there there was no ipads and there was no phones and there was no games and xbox and you know playstation 4 no 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 well we were standing there hour after hour i i think if the youth today look at us they would go how boring would that be look at those dear youngsters this is boring wasted some time but man it, it was good you know we would throw it and it would over the water it was really good and and it brings back fond memories of that See, stones is good for something. It gives us pleasure. Those poor stones, if a stone could speak and they go, there I was basking in the sun next on the river, and this guy came around, he picked me up and threw me, now I'm at the bottom of this river. All the mud all over me, hey, if a stone could speak. But he gave me pleasure for those few seconds and those few moments. So a lot of things we can do with stones, you know, when we think about stones. And, and also a stone is really hard and it, it is a rock, isn't it? It gives stability. I remember when I um, trained to become a teacher, we went on a, on a field trip. And in South Africa, they call it the Sotpansberga. I don't know how you say it in English. Southpan Mountains or something. But it's a big mountain range there in eastern Transvaal. And we went there. And, and one of the things is we start at the base and then we climb this mountain. It's safe, you know, it's a whole group going through. But there was one place there. There was one area there where it was a rock face. And the only way that you can get up was with a ladder. And I looked at this thing and I go, whoo, is that thing going to hold us? It wasn't too high. I would say maybe 20 meters up. But you can fall hard. You know, 20 meters, you can hurt something. And we started climbing up and there's this ladder, you know, and we started climbing up. And when we came to the top, it was amazing for me to see this. That this ladder, and some stages we were four people on the ladder. Four. And when we came to the top, it was amazing for me to see this. That they had a cable, a big cable, going around a big rock. It went all around the rock, a cable, just one cable, came down at this one side, and they attached the ladder to that cable. What was holding up that ladder? The rock. And it was a big rock. And I thank God it was a big rock, because I'm a big dude. And four big dudes on a, on a, on a ladder, man, there's a lot of weight there. And we were climbing that thing out, but the rock was the stability. The rock was the stability. And you see these days as well, climbers get onto these rocks and they climb up on these rocks. There's a lot of use for rocks and pebbles, isn't there? It's stability. You look at a rock and you go, that brings you stability. In earthquakes and all these things. I came across this one. I like that. I don't think there's going to be a lot of storms that can push that house around. What this guy done is he says, I have built my house on the rock. You remember Jesus' words when he says, you know, when the man builds his house on the sand, what will happen? Up comes the storm and it washes it away. And then Jesus in his own words says, but there's a man built his house on a rock. And the storms and the waters came up and what happened? He was standing. Why? Because rocks bring stability. I can tell you there's a lot of winds that can blow against that thing. She's going to hold. She's going to stand. Can you see in the background there's the sea? And it looks to me, it looks to me 
as if there's a lot of wind going on because I see a few white, you know, horses on the water. So there's a lot of things that we can use rocks for. And here Peter says in your scripture verse this morning, coming to him as to a living stone. Uh, he describes Jesus Christ there. That a living stone to him. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And you know what I like about this passage? It's not a dead stone. Have you seen that? He didn't say coming to him as a stone. What did he say? The key word there is a living stone. And I love that. Because when you go to Jerusalem and you visit the grave there, who's been to his grave? I haven't been there, but I'm on my way. Whether in this life or not. You know, if we go to heaven, I don't want to see the grave anymore because we're going to be with him. Amen. He's not there, my brother. You know, you go there and you can do DNA tests. You can, you can grab the soil and put it through all of these DNA tests. You won't even find his DNA there. So rubbish and nonsense to these people who say they've got the cloths which they have his blood on it. You know, there's that nonsense out there. And now people coming, oh, if I can only touch the cloth, it's the precious cloth of Jesus. I don't care about precious cloths. I've got the living Christ. Amen. Oh, one lady baked a, 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 she put a toast in and when the toast came out, it looked to her as if it's the sign of Mary. And now all of a sudden this little bread is going to be taken into and everybody, ooh, ooh, I don't care about toast who looks like somebody because I've got the living stone, amen? Have you got the living stone this morning? He says there, coming to him as to a living stone. And that is talking as of Jesus. But you see also in the Bible, stones were really important. We find this. Coming to him as to a living stone. Here in uh, David, I want to read to you 2 Samuel chapter 22 verse 1. David is talking about this. He's talking about the Lord. Uh, and we're going to see a reference here to, to those stones and to the rocks here. He says in Second Samuel ch uh, chapter 22 verse 1. That was a little bit too loud. I heard my voice a bit, so I just want to get it in there. Amen. He says, he says, 2 Samuel 22 verse 1, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. On the day, listen to this now, when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. What would the man say if God rescued him from his enemies? What would the man say? What would a man say today if we come and the Lord come into your situation? Where there's trouble around you and it feels as if you're sinking and depressed and everything. And the Lord lifts you up. What would you say? Praise the Lord, my brother. You know what he said? Look at him. He says in verse 2, The Lord is my rock. This is what he says. He says, And my fortress. Who knows? Who's seen a fortress? A fortress has got big walls around it. Built with stone and rock. He says he's my fortress and my deliverer. There in verse 32 he says, Who is a rock except God? This is David, thinking about my experience on the mountain there in Sotpansberga, thinking about that, and thinking that big rock, where that big, big cable went around. Man, the rock that we serve, the rock that David is talking about, is much more mightier than that big rock. He says, he's my deliverer. In verse 47 of that chapter, he says, the Lord lives, the rock of salvation. You see what Peter calls him? Peter says he's a living stone. David in the Old Testament already said that. He said the Lord lives in verse 47 of 2 Samuel 22. Is that exciting you? It should put a big smile on your face. I'm talking about a rock. I'm talking about a rock of salvation. I'm talking about a deliverer. You sit there in your pain and in your trouble and all the dark clouds is upon your life i give you this morning the living stone but look in the new testament he calls him a stone i'm going to show you that in a minute but he's not just a small little pebble stone he's a mighty rock he is a mighty rock the rock of deliverer 
And then he says, you see, it's a living stone. We are coming to him. David came to God when he could have killed, when he could have raised an army, when the enemies was against him. Many a times, many a times. Where did he go to? Did he go to people and start complaining about it? No, no, he went to the Lord in prayer. And who delivered him? God delivered him. I want you to face your problems this morning when you look at them. And I want you to call out to Jesus. Because he's the only one who can deliver you. He's the only one. Not only from your sin and your shame. But he's also there in the darkest hour as he was for David. David could have killed Saul on his own. He had the opportunity. They went into a rock. There was Saul. David was on the deeper side of, of this, uh, in, the, in this rock, in, in this cave. And he came out and Saul was sleeping and he went. He could have killed him easily. But he just cut off a seam of his garment. Why? Because God was in control. He says there to a living stone. You see that? That points towards Christ. We find him. And there's so many scripture verses I can go to in the Old Testament. In Psalms. Oh, Psalms is beautiful. It, the rock is laid out beautiful throughout the whole of Psalms. Where David cries out about, he is our rock. We sang it this morning. Ascribe greatness to the Lord, our God, our rock. Is he your rock this morning? But then he says living stones. You see that? Plural. Who is this? This is us. He says we come to him. And now he says by God, but you also as living stones are being built into a spiritual house. Have you ever seen yourself as a stone? Not stoned, okay? That's not us. No. We don't go there. We don't get stoned. No, no. He says, but you also as living stones. Hallelujah. He says, built into a spiritual house. And we see this play off in front of us. You remember when, uh, when Jesus was walking with Peter and he says, who does the people say I am? Who does the people say, Peter, that I am? And his name wasn't Peter then, he was Simon. He says, Simon, who does the people say I am? And Simon came to me and says, they say you're a prophet, and they say you're this, and they say you're that. And then he turns to him and he says, but who do you say I am? And the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, and he says these words. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you should shout hallelujah by now. Open up by the Holy Spirit to Peter. Or to Simon. Let me use that name for now. And then he turns to him. Jesus turns to him and says, You are right, Simon by Jonah, because the Holy Spirit made you to say that. And then we find this scripture. Remember, we come to him and we are built in as living stones into a spiritual house. We see it all happen here in Matthew 16, 18. He says, And I also say to you, you are Peter. And on this rock... I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevent or prevail against it. Look at this now. He changes his name from Simon to Peter. That's where his name changed. If you go into the Greek, he uses the name Petros. He says, and I say to you that you are Petros. You know what Petros means in Greek? Not you, brother Peter. You know that. <laughs> it means a little pebble. You remember when I grew up next to the Val River? You took that pebble and you throw it over the water. He says, you are Simon, but you are now a rock, but a small pebble. A Petros. That's the word he used. Can you see there's a comma there? That comma is very important, by the way. I'll just throw it in here, okay, as a freebie. As an extra in this teaching. That comma is very important. He says, and on this rock... And he uses the Greek word Petra. Now what does Petra mean? Petra means a mountain range. You know what, you know what David said in the Old Testament? He said, you are my rock. You are my deliverer. Hallelujah. You are my salvation. You are the living rock. That's what David said in the Old Testament. Here Jesus comes to him and he says, you are Simon. I will call you now Petros. 
which is a small little pebble. And he says, on this rock, Petra, this mountain range, I will build my church. Guess who is that mountain range? It's he himself, Jesus Christ. So you say, why do you say this comma is important there? Because there's a group out in the world called the Roman Catholic Church who, who don't read the comma in there. They go, oh, that's the Pope. You see, he said, you are Peter, the Pope, the first Pope. And on this rock, this rock, Peter, on this rock, Pope, on this one here, I will build my church. That is why we've got the Roman Catholic Church. But no, 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 there's a comma in there. In the real Greek, it says, he says, Petrus, you're a small people, and on this rock, Jesus Christ, I will build my church. We don't need a pope on this earth. Why not? Because we have got a mediator with us already in heaven. And what is his name? What is his name? Jesus. Come on, cry it out. What is his name? Jesus. Praise the Lord. We don't need a priest. A man. Let, let, let me tell you, just, I'm just throwing this in the extra here, okay? You don't need me to stand in your for, for the, You can go to the Lord Himself. The veil has been taught from top to bottom, and you've got access into the Holy of Holies. You, you who sit here this morning has got that. You don't need me. I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm an elder, okay? You call me pastor, some of you, I'm an elder. I'm, I'm just looking after the flock. I'm preaching God's word. I'm preaching the gospel. As an evangelist, as a teacher, that doesn't matter what I am. I'm not making any claims on any of those names. I'm just privileged to bring you the word of God this morning. He says, but you also, as living stones. Have you seen he didn't say you as stones? Have you noticed? Why? Everybody put your hand like that. Come on, everybody. If you don't do it, everybody's going to see. Put your hand like that and blow in it. If you don't feel something in your hand, there's something seriously wrong. What does that mean if you can feel that? What does it mean? You're still alive. Amen. Praise God. That was clear. Amen. Yeah, what a relief. Whew. And he says it there, you as living stones are being built into, into this spiritual house. But you see, there's three things quickly I want to tell you about stones. Three important things the Bible teaches us. Stones brings us memory. We are called stones of memory. Yes? Stones of memory. This is what stones do in the Bible. Let's look at the first one. In, it, it's a reminder of the laws of God in the Old Testament. If you go to Deuteronomy 27 verse 1, you will find out in, in instruction by Moses to the people. He says, when you go, when you move in, I want you to take a physical rock. And I want you to paint it, to whitewash it. And then I want you to print the law of God on these stones. Why would he do that? Why would Moses tell the people to do that? So that those stones become stones of what? Of the memory of the law of God. That's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament. And even to these days, there is documentaries where in the mountains in Arabia, they found some of these stones, which was painted back, back, way back when these people was moving through the land. White was stones to put the law of God in there. And these stones became what? Stones of memory. Stones of memory. Not only that, there's many more, but for the sake of time, uh, it's also a reminder of the miracles of God. If you go back to Deuteronomy 27 again, he says that they need to take out of uh, and Joshua, sorry, you need to take out of the river. There's 12 men, each one from each tribe needs to go into the river, and out of the river Jordan, they need to pick up a stone. And they walk through the river to the other side, and they pile these stones on top of each other, and it became what? Stones of memory to remember the miracles of God. To remember the miracles of God. He says, pile them up as a sign. And in that passage he says, and it's the people came and they asked, what does it mean when you see these stones piled up like that? What is it? It is a memory of the miracles of God. You see, stones has got a significant thing about memory. But you see, we use that as well, don't we? We also use stones as, a, as memory. How do we use it? What is that? It's a tombstone. 
It's a tomb wood, is it? Or is it a tomb plastic? No, what do we use? Stone. And what happens when you go into a graveyard? And, and maybe a loved one has passed on. What do you do? You walk up to a what? To a stone. And what do you see on the stone? You see some writing on it. And there's a name there. And there's a last name there. And as soon as you look at that, what comes into your mind? Memories. Isn't it right? You start to remember things. And I've seen sometimes people stand in front of these stones and they weep and they cry because they miss, because memories make them miss. But I've also seen some people standing there and they start laughing. Now, are they disrespectful? No. They might remember a funny thing. It's a good memory that came back. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, yes, it comes back. But we use stones as memory. Brother and sister, what is Peter saying to us this morning? When he uses the word, he says it there, you also as living stones are being built into a spiritual house. What does he mean? He says that we are built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, and offer up a sacrifices. It means that you and I are becoming stones of memory. Stones of memory, you and I. Think about that. And I want to ask you the question this morning. What memories are you leaving as a child of God when you are going to pass on? Or not even when you pass on, even today. Even if I go to your family members or somebody that you know and I ask about you, what is the memories they've got about you? What are they going to recite about you? What are they going to say about you? What is it? Are they going to say you're a man of God, you're, a, you're, a, you're a, a woman of God, but man, when you see them outside of the church, whew, you don't want to go there. What kind of memories are you leaving behind? What posterity are you leaving behind? Here is things he gives us, he says we need to be spiritual, we need to be holy, and we are built up into spiritual sacrifices. What spiritual sacrifices are you going to be remembered for? What are people going to remember you for? You see how serious it becomes? Stones. We are living stones. But a stone is used as a memory. Does your life reflect what God has done for you? Does it? Are you so grateful to show the people as a living stone walking into your workplace, as a living stone having fun outside with your family, as a living stone in the malls, as a living stone on the motorway? What memories? I worked with a lady once and uh, in the office. She was a tough lady and I was on my way home on the motorway once. And I was going perfectly fine and I saw a gap. And as I swerved over to the gap, I saw this car out of my blind eye just coming racing over. She was going much faster. And I went, oops, just sorry, you know. She didn't realize it was me. But man, the signs that came out of that car. Now, why am I saying that? Because if it was the other way around, and see, to this day, she doesn't know I saw that. To this day, and I wasn't going to remind her. But what if it was the other way around, and I went like that, crazy, I just lost my mind. That builds up a memory in her mind, and someday, someday she walks in front, and she meets you, and you sit around, and, and you start talking, you go, uh, John Schopenhauer, oh, I know that guy, I know him. Oh yeah, but you know, he's such a lovely man of God, and she goes, what's he pulling back out of her mind? That experience he had with me, yes? Oh, that doesn't fit, the picture doesn't fit. One is a square and one is round. It doesn't fit. What I'm saying this morning is what Peter is saying. We need to remember that we are, we are also stones of memory for the Lord our God. What else? Second thing that stones show us out of the Bible is that stones of sacrifice. He says it there in our scripture verse. He says we are also living stone built up in a spiritual house. Remember, remember we are building. We are building memory amongst each other in our spiritual house. This is the spiritual house. And then secondly, the spiritual sacrifices. What are they using in the Old Testament to sacrifice? Altars. What did they build the altars with? 
stones. It says it right there in Exodus 20 verse 25. And if you make me an altar of stone, this is God speaking to them, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use a tool on it, you have profaned it. Offer up, you see, this is the thing. They built these altars with stone. And it's really interesting for me. You see the hewn stone there? It means you, you cannot cut it into perfect pieces to build this. God wanted it to be the rough stones. And I wondered about that. And I, and I believe I came to the point where if it's God's work, it's His work, it's not man's. You know, if you can imagine, if you can imagine if air, all of them had to cut it, it will be like today. Some churches you visit and it's the most beautiful architecture. You walk in there and you go, man, you know, am I clean enough to walk into this beautiful place? You see, we've become as mankind so drawn to success. We walk into these palaces, which they say is a church or these things. Millions of dollars spent on these places, but nothing goes to the people. Nothing. You know, I, I wonder if they came there and Abraham was a very well of man and he said, man, I'm going to build the most beautiful altar to God. They're going to cut it out of marble. I'm going to lay it perfectly, beautifully. Oh, man. It's a, and you know what will happen when they start offering? It will be false fire. You know why? Because they will stand in adornment of the altar. Wow. Let me tell you, altar is only a place of sacrificing and offering and worshiping God. That's all it is. An altar should never replace God. He says, don't cut and make this altar, build it out of rough stone. But what does it teach us? It teaches us, you and me, brother and sister, that we are living stones. Is that what Peter said? It also means not only are we stones of memory, but we're also stones of sacrifice. Why are you sacrificing for God? Have you asked that question? You see, here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes about it. He says, I beseech you. He says, I urge you. I can see him standing there. He was a small man, apparently had droopy eyes. He was always teary. I can see him standing here this morning to this church. And he says, brothers and sisters at Karam Downs, I urge you, I beg you, I beseech you. Do what? By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a dead sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. A dead sacrifice. Is that what he's saying? No, but some people are like that. I see a lot of dead sacrifices. Oh, we just do church. I just do it. And you know what the Bible says? He says, strengthen the knees, lift up the feeble hands, and, and do work for God. Now, if, if you think I'm, I'm trying to do a works-based sermon here, it's not what it is. He says, no, no, we need to give our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. That means, listen to me, that everything you do has got the approval from God. You will do nothing if it hasn't got the approval from God. You will not go places where you shouldn't go if it hasn't got the approval of God. That's a living sacrifice. It costs you something to serve God. But people want to have it easy these days. And look, I must say this morning, I'm so proud of you, you people this morning. Normally you can go and ask any pastor out there. When it's a long weekend, what happens? People get lazy. Yeah? They disappear. It looks like a rapture in the churches, but look at this morning. Praise the Lord. This is mature children of God we're preaching to. Amen? You sacrifice, you give something to God. He says, holy and acceptable to God. Not only are we stones of memory, but we're also stones of what? Of sacrifice. My question is to you is, what sacrifice are you living out for God? It should be everything. Everything. Nothing that you have. Your job, your house, your car, your bike. I can say that now. <laughs> I'm looking at bikes, your bike, your paintings, nothing belongs to you. Have you ever thought about that? If you're a child of, if you're in the world, it belongs to you, man. And the more you have, the more you want. And the more you get, the more worried you become. And that drives you. Let me tell you, your passion will drive you. And if your passion is the world, the world will drive you. 
But if your passion is God and Christ, He will drive you. And you know what? He says, come to me and cast your burdens unto me. Carry my yoke. His yoke is light. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added unto you. And here he says that we need to become a living sacrifice. So we are stones of sacrifice. What's the first one? Stone of memory. And second one? A living stone of sacrifice. And finally this morning, we are stones of in the image and in the likeness of God. Yes? Have you noticed in the scripture verse when he says first, in verse 5, I'll go all the way back, he says, in verse 5, coming to him as a living what? Stone. Rejected by men and those, and he says you also as living stones. We want to become like Jesus. Amen? What is, what is the word doing? What is my preaching doing? What is the Holy Spirit doing with you? He's changing you into the image of His Son. That's what He's doing. Day by day. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The things that offended God, the sin against God... The filthy things that destroyed me as a person. I don't want to do them anymore. Why? Because I want to be like Jesus. So we become stones into the image and into the likeness of what? Of whom? Of Jesus. You say, where do you get this from? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Therefore, you see there's that word there. What do you need to do with the word therefore? You need to read before it. For time's sake, I'm going to jump over it. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ like a living stone, he is a what? A new creation. That, the, the old things, the old things you don't know more. You're a new creation. What creation are you now? A living stone. Built into what? Into a spiritual house. To offer at what? Spiritual sacrifices. To build what? A spiritual memory. Yes, you see how it fits together. He says the old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. Listen to this. Beloved stones, living stones. Now we are children of God and it's not yet being revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be what? Like Him. Like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. How wonderful is that? Now I want to end this morning with a warning. So what is the three things about stones? Memory, sacrifice, likeness, and the image of Christ. Remember those. When you go through this week, remember you're a living stone. You've got a responsibility. But now it says, of that stone, the one stone, the living stone, Jesus Christ. It says there in verse 8, 1 Peter 2 verse 8. He says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Have you noticed that? The world is rejecting Christ. Guess what's going to happen with you? The world's going to reject you. For what you carry inside of you. If he's a living stone and you're a living stone built into a royal priesthood, built into a spiritual house, carrying the memories and building a memory, Christ-like memory, you will become for the world a stone of stumbling. You see it all over now. You stand up in your workplace, you stand up in the public and you proclaim Christ, what happens? They want to crucify you. They fire you from your job. You're cast out. Nobody wants to talk to you. Your family turn their back on you. That is what's happening. It's no surprise. It's happening over the ages. It's happening today. It will happen again. So what do we do? Do we say now all of a sudden I'm not a living stone anymore? No, I'm a piece of wood. Driftwood. I need to preach that sermon. Driftwood. Piece of wood. No, 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 no. I, I'm not, no nonsense with this living stone thing. What, what nonsense is that? I'm going to be a piece of plastic, man. Plastic tastes bad. Ask me, I've done it once. Can't eat plastic. Plastic. The world's full of plastic. Looks like the real thing, but it's a molded thing. That's what plastic is. It's molded. You can mold iron as well. Oh, no, I'm going to be an iron man. I'm an iron. Look at me, I'm strong. Wait. Time will get rid of you. Time gets rid of your strength. Who knows that? 
<laughs> Ask me, yesterday I worked in the garden this morning. I was, man, when I was young, I was an iron man. I was strong. Work now this morning, I wake up and I go, oh, <laughs> don't you worry. H will get rid <laughs> H will level you. H is a good leveler, isn't it? <laughs> the old tent, my brother preached it this morning. But look at this now. He says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. You and I are appointed to the word of God. We are appointed to the word of God. Listen to me this morning. You are appointed to the word of God. Now, if you neglect the word of God, you become disobedient to the word of God. What happens? You will become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You see, this is what happens if people disobey the word of God. They become slack, fallen back nature. I want to talk to you about one, one rock. And this is a warning this morning. You need to be a rock of memory, a rock of sacrifice, likeness and image. You see, I read there in uh, Daniel chapter 2. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, this great king? He had a dream. What did he dream? A statue. A big and mighty statue. Now we know today that that statue represents all of the, the emperors that came up and all of the empires that came up. And we know it's still part of our prophecy and we know about the ten feet. And we know this is playing up off in the EU and all of those things. And there's a big focus in the world on what's happening in the world. Brothers and sisters, let me just warn you. Don't get so focused on the world that you don't see Jesus anymore. Can I say that again? Don't get so focused about the signs in the world that you forget and neglect Jesus. It says it right there. It says that there, they stumble. People stumble. Why? Being disobedient to the word which they were appointed for. They don't read the word anymore. They read signs. They read all the other stuff except him. So see now what happens here. It says it right there. Have I jumped one place? I'm getting so excited I need to keep my place. He says it there in Daniel. This big and mighty statue. And then what happened in verse 45? Daniel 2, 45. Inasmuch as he saw that the stone... You see that? What is Peter talking to us about? We come unto a living stone. The rock. Who's that stone? Jesus. He says, here, here, I see this mountain. And there at the top, I see a stone being cut from the mountain. A small stone. And that stone rolled down the mountain. Where did he eat the statue? On the feet. And then what does it say? Once it, without any hands. Hands didn't cut it down. Let me take you, tell you something. We can't fight what's coming to this world. We cannot fight the dark powers. We can't fight it. Who's cut the stone loose? Got it. Without hands. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known the king that will come to pass after this. Now what happens? This little stone came down from the mountain, hit that big statue, and he grinded it up to become nothing. You say, how do we apply it this morning? Brother and sister, I want to say to you, fall on the rock before the rock falls on you. Fall on that rock. How do I fall on that rock? You fall on your face before him and you start crying out. Say, be merciful to me, great Savior, rock of salvation. You see, David couldn't call him the rock of salvation if he didn't experience the salvation. You call on him, you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a dead beast of dread, uh, driftwood. I want to become a living stone built into a spiritual house. I want to become a special people. You don't become that by joining a church. Let me tell you that. The church isn't looking for joiners. I read nowhere in the Bible about joiners. Oh, we're just going to join your party, okay? Is it okay? Yeah, everybody's welcome. Come and join the party. No, no. No, no. You come and you are born into this line. You are born into the spiritual house. Through whom? My brother said it this morning. Through Jesus Christ comes life. So remember this morning, you're a stone of memory. You're a stone of sacrifice. 
You're in his image and his likeness. And then remember, fall on the stone before the stone falls on you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word, which is living, it's powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, cuts between bone and marrow, spirit and soul, and is the discerner of the heart. And I pray this morning as your word has spoken to us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, help us to live, to live this word out. Not only to speak it and to say it, but to live it out in our bodies as sacrifices to you, as memories to you, Lord. 